So hello, Philip and Martha, we're together for hello. our uh, service uh, for <laughs> August 2nd. So I hope you're both well. Feel good? Yeah, everything is good. Martha, did you want to show off your shirt? Did you wear that so that we would celebrate? Luke, Luke, I, I wore it so that uh, because I figured you would be in a t-shirt and I would be the only one colored. <laughs> so, so here it is. Cast it is, down the mighty. It's yeah. Uh, cast down the mighty. Send the rich away. And it's and it's Mary. And I, I refer to her in a way that I will not use in church. Uh, this particular image, but I, I love this image and. Mm -hmm. Uh, have it on a hoodie too, so it's a, she's an all-season companion mm -hmm. for me, and and I I think that there was a time in in my spiritual sojourn uh, when I put aside Mary and the saints that I had mm -hmm. grown up with, but as I look back on it now, that um, from from the perspective of of years, but also. Uh, feeling that everything that we've been through spiritually becomes a part of, of your spirituality, that you don't kind of park something away, it, it, you integrate it somehow. And I, I feel, you know, I've been able to, to refriend Mary and, and that just brings to mind all the ways in which, you know, Mary is so powerful uh, in Latino communities, you know, that each country has their, their patron uh, saint, their patron Mary, who appears in contextualized ways uh, according to the stories around her. You know, in, in Cuba, she appears as someone who rescues drowning fishermen. Well, you know, of course, in an island country, you want, you, know, you want your Madonna to rescue you from drowning when there's water all around. But, but she is a, a powerful image, and, uh, and I, I feel uh, kind of cool wearing her. So thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> So that the fist raised in resistance. Yes, yes, she's she's powerful, Mary. She's not yeah. little meek, Mary. Yeah, a, a lot of power. So you're you're reclaiming that that part of Mary that's very scriptural and very yeah. biblical. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I don't know what what word you can't say. Does it have something to do with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez or? <laughs> well. <laughs> She's my badass, Mary, okay? <laughs> oh, okay. okay. We can say that. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as, as ABC, no. <laughs> she claimed it, though. She, she claimed it, and she wants to own it. She did. She did. Yeah. Well, you know, women have claimed that, that B word for a long time now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get to see all of um, John Lewis's um, going away, going home. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I certainly think that his reputation has grown in the past three or four years. Um, certainly people have always known about him and known about his, his contributions, but um, I feel like in the last couple of years, he's continued to be somebody who fights for the things he believes in mm -hmm. um, and continues to be on the front lines of, of pushing for inclusion and and, uh, and being there together with with a broad coalition um, fighting to make this a better country. Um, at the funeral, I was kind of thinking about how people were placing him alongside Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and and every other person who was so important in the civil rights movement. And I've been reading recently this book, um, Quiet. Um, how to live as an introvert in the world of extroverts, or some, I forget what the exact title is. Um, but it compares Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks as an extrovert and an introvert. Um, and I'm not sure that those are technical, technically correct for both of those, but certainly in our perception of them, I guess, anyway, right? Um, that he played an extroverted role and she played a more introverted role. That's probably overly simplistic, but I think it gives you this idea of how they complement each other. Um, and as I was thinking about John Lewis as someone who, you know, was walking the walk. Um, you know, Rosa Parks did a lot of organizing. Um, she played her role by, um, you know, civil disobedience in, in the, the famous in instance on the bus. 
Uh, Dr. King inspired people with his speeches, um, but John Lewis was the one who took the, the hit to the head, uh, literally. You know, he was the one who, who took the beating um, and spoke so eloquently about nonviolence. Um, you know, when somebody who's, who's repeatedly getting hit on the head continues to talk about nonviolence for 40 years, that's kind of, that's, that's something you have to be impressed by, I think. Yeah. Um... I was uh, having a conversation with our, our youngest daughter, Victoria, uh, just earlier today, and, and she was asking um, whether or not, you know, I had learned about John Lewis in school, I guess, assuming that my, I was in school at a time closer to some of the more dramatic historical events, mm -hmm. but she was saying that she doesn't remember having learned about him in school, and this is, I mean, this was well into the 2000s, uh, and I think he, he was always kind of a, a sideline figure. I mean, th there were the greats, there was Martin, there was Rose at Parks, but we tended to forget about John Lewis, and the first time that she said that she was very aware of him was uh, with the, uh, at, right after the Parkland shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, you were saying how you know for forty years after taking a beating and having his skull cracked, you know, mm -hmm, he kept mm -hmm. professing nonviolence. And I think that there's another side to that 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 nonviolence also requires just a a sense of of inner joy um, mm. that fights the bitterness. And I, I was really mm. struck. I know that the cameras yesterday. I was watching part of it after the fact because I had meetings, so I was. Uh, watching the recording of the, the homegoing service and uh, they cut away right before uh, they showed the clip. I guess they were showing the clip in the church and the news cameras were all showing the casket being taken out. But of him dancing a couple of years mm -hmm. ago at a rally to, mm -hmm. to Pharrell's Happy, mm -hmm. some of mm -hmm. his favorite song. I just yeah. thought that was wonderful that, that somebody mm -hmm who had been through real struggle, who had really mm. put his body on the line, mm. uh, who was willing to sacrifice for the cause of justice that mm. came out of his faith, mm. uh, still never lost the joy. And that, that mm -hmm. struggle continues with us. It's, it's a long and sometimes it feels like a never ending struggle, mm -hmm. but it's easy to become discouraged. Um, mm -hmm. and, Holding on to the joy, I think, was a really a big eye opener for me yesterday as I was listening mm. to it, watching it. I remember hearing Samuel DeWitt Proctor, who was the pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church uh, for many years, uh, remember his, recall his uh, experiences in seminary with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, uh, Sam Proctor uh, felt that uh, most of the uh, uh, colleagues, most of the, his fellow students felt that Martin was a little bit upper class. He always had polished shoes. Um, the uh, others in the class had to go out and bust tables and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to pay for seminary. Martin never had to do that. He always mm -hmm. showed up his suits. And I don't think he was disparaging Martin, but he was making it clear that uh, it wasn't always easy for real people, real folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think John Lewis was one of those that real folks uh, identified. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if either of you remember when he first ran for Congress, but his uh, opponent was Julian Bond, who was a very good-looking uh, mm -hmm. uh, young man. Uh, in fact, when he was 28, uh, there was an effort to nominate him for vice president in 1935. But Julian ran against John, and everybody assumed that he would be the one people would love because he was mm. articulate, uh, he was elegant, uh, his shoes were always fine, and John was sometimes inarticulate. John uh, was sometimes uh, just folks, but I think uh, the voters uh, showed that they identified with John. They uh, knew who he was. They knew that he was not only walking the walk, but he was there when... Uh, thousands of uh, people who will never be recognized by history were going to be there. And uh, I think uh, that's the heritage that he left and that uh, former President Obama spoke so eloquently about yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm going to think about... Go ahead. No, go ahead. 
I was, you know, part of the legacy that he left. I, I was so moved yesterday. It was very powerful to read the piece that appeared in the Times that he had written shortly before his death to be published you know, at the, on the day of his funeral. A and he continued to, to inspire into the future that this, this is something that is, is within our resources, within us to be able to continue working for, to bring about justice. And that, that was just very meaningful to read that, knowing that on this same day, he was being eulogized by people who he was very far apart from politically, at least one of them, uh, and yet they were able to respond to each other with a level of, of respect and integrity that I think both both Congressman Lewis and former President Bush were able to recognize the value of one another, uh, aside from the partisanship. And, and that came across yesterday in the service, too. But, you know, he, reading John Lewis's words yesterday in, in that Times article, the Times opinion piece that he wrote, was uh, just a reminder that, that we have it within us to reach higher and to try to be better than we are now and to not be sucked into the ugliness, but, but to move forward. And, and I think that, you know, along with the, the joy that was in him, I think that that was also someone who just had a, a sense of peace uh, in his spirit. Uh, in, in the midst of the turbulence around him pretty much his entire life, uh, I mean, as, as a young man, he, he marched over the Edmus, Edmund Pettus Bridge, and as an old man, 80 years old, one of the last things he did was, was march in Washington uh, in a Black Lives Matter rally. So, you know, he had seen so much of, of the pain and, and the ugliness of racism, but he, there was something in his core that gave him a sense of peace and a sense of purpose. The, the letter that he wrote, I was really struck by how um, grateful he was for what he sees people in this country doing. Um, so there's a way in which he sees America at its best and, uh, and lifts that up and says, you know, I really, I really appreciate what people are doing and I, I feel so hopeful about America's future because of what I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, we know that the Voting Rights Act you know, that was so important was overturned by the Supreme Court. I mean, was it uh, six years ago or something? Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could almost imagine someone who knew the whole history of that, who knew that, you know, a church was bombed and, and people were, were set upon by, you know, police dogs and fire hoses and, and all that it took to get that to happen. You know, I could just imagine someone being so bitter to say, you know, how could that happen? How could all of that progress be undone? And like you say, he was a very joyful and, uh, and an optimistic person. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he, he embodied kind of a humility, you know, that idea that um, he came from humble beginnings, that not everybody who comes from humble beginnings continues to be humble, mm -hmm. um, but he certainly had a very humble, very gentle spirit, which was also connected with strength and with bravery. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, colleagues from the National Council of Churches, uh, who's now an Episcopal priest, uh, posted on uh, Twitter today uh, a picture of John Lewis and one of the former white supremacists who had, uh, mm. uh, and uh, they had reconciled and uh, they had forgiven each other. And uh, Dan's uh, final comment on that uh, uh, just struck me as the final tribute to John Lewis. Oh, if we could hear their conversation in heaven now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. that's, that speaks to his character. Yeah. Let us pray. God, we rejoice in our calling to be ambassadors for Christ called not as privileged saints, but as servants to one another. Remind us that we need not be bowed by life's frustrations or the fear of death because you have made all things new. We need you, Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Last week, 
Paul described us as clay jars, today as earthly tents. Far from perfect mortals, we must pass on the message of God's reconciliation with the world. Paul writes, For we know that if the earthly tent we have is destroyed, that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan under our burden, because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God. And I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we love knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses as against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. We are ambassadors for Christ. If God is making his appeal to us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Holy wisdom. Thanks. Thanks be to God. The good news according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. 
the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So we're in part um, four of this series on Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Um, and I'm always struck by how people can take a verse of Paul out of context and make a very simplistic, very generalized uh, theological position from Paul. Um, so, for example, at Bible study just before, I was talking about how people take the verse, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. And they say, you can go out and you can become a Fortune 500 CEO <laughs> or an Olympic medalist or something. Um, and nothing is wrong with any of that, but... Um, but it just misses so much of the larger context of Paul, I think. So the idea that Paul is saying, I can do all things through the Christ who strengthens me, which is from, uh, I think that's from Philippians, um, is Paul writing in prison, saying that I can go to prison, I can go to prison for God, I can face death for God, um, I can face a crowd that's gonna stone me for preaching, um, and I can do all these things uh, through God who strengthens me. So we were just talking about John Lewis who, you know, gave an address to the, the crowd assembled at the Lincoln Memorial at the age of 23 and had already been in prison 25 times and would be imprisoned another 20 times before the decade was out. Um, so, you know, not everybody feels like they can go to prison, uh, like they can willingly uh, engage in civil disobedience knowing that they're going to be arrested, knowing that they're going to be maligned, knowing that they're going to lose friends. Um, knowing that people are going to try to, to um, ruin their reputation. Um, so that takes a unique brand of uh, bravery and a certain idea of your purpose and of a vision that you have of what you're trying to do. Um, so to think about when Paul says, I can do all th things, to realize that he's sitting in a jail cell um, and, he's been, and he's been beaten and he's been accused of all kinds of horrible things. Um, that that's uh, kind of the, 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 the real context there. So I think Paul, people will use Paul in a very simplistic way. Um, they'll overgeneralize some of the things he says. It's very easy for Paul to create these binaries, to create these false dichotomies, where things, where things are either one thing or they're the other, um, in a very simplistic way. And you can kind of see where Paul is using them, some things as um, setting up the flesh and the spirit, or talking about the law and the gospel, um, talking about you know lists of things that people should not be doing. People should not be slandering. They should not be fornicating. They should not be jealous, um, and just missing the idea of grace and forgiveness, and and what Christ has accomplished for us, um, and coming up with a long list of things you need to do and not do. So. It's always concerning to me in which the way in which people will use Paul to create these very simplistic, it's either this or it's that. Um, and Paul is certainly much more complicated than that. But his rhetoric is such that you can come up with things as being all one or the other sometimes if you just take a line um, out of context. Um, and I was thinking of this um, and I was listening to uh, Krista Tippett, who has her program On Being uh, that you can listen to. And she had someone on talking about grief. And I think as we're all going through this time, um, it's very important to realize the grief that we're experiencing and to know about grief in a way that is not overly simplistic. Uh, and Americans are, are uniquely uh, impervious to grief. <laughs> we, people don't want to experience grief. They don't, they don't want to, to live with grief. Um, you know, they want to be impervious to it. We're not, of course, but they, they want to be that way. Um, and Americans want to, to have solutions to things and they want to fix things. So the idea is that you're either happy or you're sad. Um, you're either healthy or you're depressed. Um, you're either grieving or you're, you're over your grief and you're, you're ready to live again. We, we create those false dichotomies about what grief means. Um, so a lot of people are very taken by the writings of Elizabeth Kubler ross who talks about the stages of grief, right? She talks about denial and bargaining and uh, this anger, anger <laughs> depression, depression and then acceptance. Yes. <laughs> um, so people kind of think, well, on Monday, I'm going to be in denial and on Tuesday, I'm going to be bargaining. And by the end of the week, I'll, I'll be through it all. 
Um, and this woman uh, on Krista Tippett, I guess it's two weeks ago, Pauline Boss, uh, wrote, writes about grief and learning to live with grief that is unresolved is the title of her book. Um, you know, she points out that when Kubler-Ross is talking about those stages of grief, she's talking about somebody who's dying. Um, so an endpoint of acceptance, maybe just you're dead. <laughs> you're no longer grieving because you're dead at that point. Um, it's helpful for us to understand how we can experience grief in other parts of our life in other ways. It's helpful for us to think about how um, loss comes in many forms and we can experience that as grief. Um, so it's helpful not to just take you know, a template of five stages of grief and then impose that on anything. When it was meant to explain what someone goes through when they've been told that they're dying, which not many people get that experience, um, we can't just impose that as a template on every kind of grief and every kind of loss. Um, so I think she does a very good job of talking about complicated grief and talking about ambiguous grief um, in a way that I think is very helpful for what we're experiencing now, which is loss on multiple levels um, and loss that is very ambiguous. And, you know, we might think, well, someone else lost someone to COVID. Um, another person lost a job due to COVID and I haven't lost anything. Um, but we've all lost something. We've all uh, lost a sense of freedom. We've all lost a sense of the ease by which we can be together with other people. Um, so that idea of ambiguous grief, I think, is very important for thinking about what we're all experiencing and to realize the way in which many of us are being traumatized. Um, just by COVID and just by that whole situation, even apart from what's happened in terms of the George Floyd people witnessing that death, um, you know, after seeing Sandra Bland, after seeing Trayvon Martin, um, you know, it's not just about George Floyd, it's about a pattern that, that people see as recurring. Um, we have that on top of it, and we have an election coming up. Um, so, but just to take COVID in and of itself, and the way in which we're being told what we have to do to be safe, um, there's so much loss and it's ambiguous and it's complicated and it's not gonna be resolved. Everyone's waiting for the day when COVID is gonna be gone, <laughs> when the virus is gonna be over. Um, when I announced that we weren't gonna be worshiping in church, I said, we're not gonna be worshiping in church for one or two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of thought that, and maybe, you know, maybe I was the only one who was that stupid, I don't know, but I think a lot of us are thinking, okay, it's it's, it's July, and it must be over now. And now we're looking, okay, it's August. It, it must be over by now. And the sad truth is it could be over if people were doing what they were told to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's never going to go back to what people want. And so there's this way in which we're experiencing this grief. It's unresolved. Um, we don't know when it's going to end. We're not going to see the end we're hoping for. And so I thought that Pauline Boss's book um, about grief and learning to live with unresolved grief, um, she, Krista Tippett, of course, lifted that up as something that was important for this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you referenced Elizabeth Kubler-Ross because I remember first reading her in 1981 in my first summer of seminary uh, as I was doing clinical pastoral education. And, and yes, I mean, the title of the book is On Death and Dying. It is specific mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm group of people, but that that's just become those five stages, even though we could only easily remember four out of the five a few minutes ago. Uh, those five stages have just become so well known everywhere that, you know, what, one of our favorite episodes of The Simpsons is Homer eating a poison fish and then going through all five stages simultaneously until he reaches acceptance that, oh, he's going to die from this fish, but obviously he doesn't. So I mean, when it reaches when it reaches the Simpsons, you know this has pervaded you know, the popular culture. But I, I think one of the things too is is that grief is not linear. You know, we we think we go through these stages. You know, whether there's the Kubler Ross's five stages or whether there are other stages, but we don't normally go through grief in in a linear fashion. Uh, it, it takes all kinds of circuitous routes, and I think that, that uh, that's helpful 
now to remember, uh, you know, you don't get from point A to B to Z in one straight shot. But sometimes we expect that of ourselves. I, I think that we, we can be so goal oriented in, in our culture that we assume that we're going to check off the lists and and then are surprised when grief comes back and, and haunts us again. You know, that there are many layers of, of grief to COVID. Uh, you know, as, as you know, we, we lost an aunt two weeks ago, an 88 year old aunt uh, in Florida who was gone within a week of her COVID diagnosis. Now at 88, had she died of natural causes? I think the experience of grief, my experience of grief, that of her children and, and our extended family of cousins would have been different. But the, the fact that you know she was 88, she had made it to that point in her life only to die within a week of, of this horrible illness that, that had no cure. I mean, from the time that she was diagnosed, we all knew that she, the outlook was, was not good. Uh, and that complicates the grief. You know, if she had died again in her sleep, we would have grieved her, but we would have grieved her perhaps without the the anger and the frustration being woven into it, the, the unfairness of it being woven into it. And COVID, as you said, has caused us to lose, has caused loss on so many different levels. I mean, you know, certainly as, as congregations, we've not been able to be together. We've not been able to partake of the sacrament. St. Thomas opened two weeks ago, and, and we're still living very tentatively into what that looks like. And, and from week to week, there are little adjustments that we have to make to ensure that we're safe, but a good number of people don't feel safe enough to come back yet. So we, we're living with that realization too. So I mean, it's affected our ability to get together. It's, it's affected uh, families from being able to gather uh, this, this time of year when normally you know, families might be traveling to see children or grandchildren or, or vice versa, they'd be coming to us. Uh, there's the grief of knowing that we don't have that, that it's disrupted our ways of of organizing our lives, um, you know, we we are fortunate in that you know Philip has been retired for several years, and my job has gone on. I'm able to work from home, but we both know people who who have lost jobs or who have had their time cut back. That's particularly true. I see among clergy colleagues who have had you know their time cut back, and and then what does that mean for them and their families and being able to meet their needs. And, and we grieve just the, the way that things used to be. You know, be, being an introvert, being at home is not a big deal to me. I'm fine being at home, but I miss the sense of normalcy that on a weekend I could just hop in my car and go somewhere and without having to, to pre-plan so much and, and without it feeling so strained, uh, on the other end when I get to where I'm going. And you're right, uh, Pastor Jim, that, that we're not going to go back to some semblance of normal anytime soon, that, that we're not going to, to live into a new reality for a while. I mean, some people say when there's a vaccine, others are cautious and don't necessarily trust a new vaccine. And I wonder how people dealt with this the last time that there was a pandemic in, in 1918 and 19. Um, my father's mother died in that pandemic when he was only a few months old. And I wish that I had a sense of, of how people eventually returned to life or whether they, you know, what the paradigm shift looked like in the early part of the 20th century, if there's something that we can learn from that, both uh, as individuals and, and as a community, as, as the communities that are our families and the community that is the church. Um, and, you know, going back to what Paul says, you know, I, I've always loved that particular verse from 2 Corinthians, you know, the, the oldest passed away. And in the Revised Standard Version, which is where I first learned it, is the oldest passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
And mm -hmm. certainly he's referring to life in Christ here, but we're living in that time. The old has passed away and we're not yet seeing what the new is going to look like. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. The new hasn't yet come. So we're living in the in-between time. The, the story is still being birthed and we don't know what what that birth will look like or when it will happen. I think COVID has kind of accentuated something that happens to us all the time and we don't realize it. We talk about the ambiguity of grief and uh, as we talk in terms of binaries that we, I used to be, I used to be sad when my mother died and I'm over it and that kind of thing. But when I think it never really goes away. Uh, within the last week, uh, I heard from a boyhood friend of mine uh, who was seriously ill and uh, being treated uh, my age. And I come from a small town so that uh, everybody I hear from that hometown is somebody who I cannot remember never having known. Mm -hmm. And when I think of uh, my friendship uh, with Jeff, uh, now a uh, fellow sexual engineering, but uh, when we did, I remember uh, how we played, and I uh, remember the games that we played. I remember he was so much uh, better at athletics uh, than I was. But uh, I find that uh, I am not only grieving the fact that my good friend is uh, facing a very serious challenge, I'm grieving the boys that we once were. I'm grieving the uh, simplicity. I'm grieving uh, that we can no longer read about uh, Ike in my weekly reader. Uh, and it surprises me that I am so emotionally impacted. But it is a very ambiguous grief. And uh, that, that forces us to compartmentalize our grief. Uh, so we can put it in a little box in our brains uh, and then come back and say, well, I'm glad I'm over that type cheered up and it's not good anymore. It is ambiguous that the, uh, the uh, virus uh, forces us to uh, deal with those kinds of things, particularly the ambiguity of anticipation. We don't know what the new normal is going to be. We don't know what it's going to be like. Uh, and uh, that kind of scary It's reassuring to uh, remember that uh, God has made all things new. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm very taken by this idea of the, the ambiguous grief, that it's not that the, that the grief is somehow um, less, it's not that we're not aware of it, it's that we don't know what it is. Um, it's as powerful as you know, any other grief, but it's not clear to us um, that we're grieving. So that's, that's the power of it, is that we don't realize that we're grieving. So. You know, when my, when my dad uh, was getting into the late stages of dementia and didn't recognize me anymore, um, that was a powerful grief that was no way to process it. It was not in any of Kubler-Ross's stages of, you know, what do I do now? Um, not that she's that simplistic, but we often make her that simplistic. Um, and now I have another member of my family who is a sim is is a similar kind of grief not because of that dementia she had a stroke and cognitively she's there in a way that my dad wasn't but she's not able to take care of herself and she's not able to communicate um except in just very you know very limited ways um so there's a very real grief that's you know not because she's gone but because we've lost something i've lost something in that relationship um, so not to realize that that's grief is, is really um, difficult to, to kind of work through. I think realizing that it's grief in an ambiguous kind of a way, that it's not complete loss, it's partial loss, is probably a helpful thing for us to try to deal with it. Um, you know, loss, you know, from, you know, you move from one house to another, that's loss. Uh, divorce is loss. Um, your child, you know, leaving home is a loss. Um, moving from middle school to high school is a loss. Retirement is a loss. Um, you know, getting rid of your old car that you've been driving for 20 years and put 100,000 miles on is a loss. Um, they're complicated and they're maybe a little bit ambiguous or maybe we don't think of it as being loss, but they are, they're all loss. And just, you know, you can't go through life without experiencing loss unless 
nothing ever changes and you never do anything. Um, so loss is a part of life. And I think maybe ambiguous grief is an important thing for us all to think about and to, to focus on in a time like this. Um, to realize that, you know, normal grief is someone dies and then you go to the, the funeral or you go to the wake. Um, you know, you mark their, their gravestone with a flower. Um, you know, what do we do with other kinds of grief? Um, you know, a child is stillborn. You know, there's no, there's no ritual for that. There's no, there's no announcement in the newspaper. Um, all these public ways in which we have support for, you know, unambiguous grief. Um, you know, how do we, how do we deal that, uh, deal with that in a time like this? So I think we need to talk about what kind of loss we're experiencing and the fact that it's not going to be resolved in any way that we would like it to be. Um, it's not going to have a discrete beginning and a discrete end. Um, it's not going to go through one stage and then another of grief. And that's going to be hard. Um, I was thinking about um, bonus material for this week. Or you might do something different. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was thinking about bonus material um, to talk about Hamilton. Mm. Um, so I've, I've watched Hamilton twice now and there's, there's, there's these um, Easter eggs that people talk about. So there are these little things that are, that you kind of discover uh, that they're hiding in plain sight. Um, so there's these little references that you have to be maybe a, mm -hmm. a, a Broadway geek or something to, to catch them, right? Yes. So one of them, so one of them was uh, Washington saying he's the model of a modern minute major general. Yes, there's Gilbert and Sullivan in there. There's uh -huh. South Pacific in there as well. So that's Pirates of Penzance, model of a modern yeah. major general. Yeah, it's Pirates. And then there's another place where they talk about, you know, you've got to be carefully taught, which is mm. from South Pacific. Yeah. This is 1976, uh, when uh, Hamilton shouts to John Adams, sit down, John. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he does not finish the phrase, and apparently uh, he wasn't allowed to by Disney. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, Lin-Manuel Miranda said that uh, to stream on Disney they were only allowed to drop the F-bomb once and it's in the show normally three or four times so they, you can tell where they've mm -hmm. worked their way around it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was trying to figure out, people were saying that, um, that King George was uh, referencing the British invasion uh, with, the, with the Beatles mm. uh, musically more than anything else maybe but um, okay but one of the lines he has is you'll be sorry when I'm gone yeah and you saw where I was asking on uh, social media where that where that's from because it sounds familiar to me and somebody said it's from Jesus Christ Superstar it, it's from a lot of different places yeah so. yeah, yeah. And and even you know not in that exact phrasing, but even the Carter family has has used to sing you know Will you miss me when I'm gone? So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just a really common theme. Mm -hmm. And he also talks about when I'm gone, uh, when you're gone, I'll go mad, which I thought mm -hmm. was kind of a nice tip of the hat to the the whole madness of King George. Yeah, yeah. So the whole idea of a, of, a, of a breakup, a relationship breakup, a breakup song, yeah, um, is kind of brilliant. Um, and the way in which, you know, the dancing and, and, you know, jumping off of tables and, and, you know, the somersaults that people are doing, and then King George comes out, you know, he's almost gliding, you know, that's mm -hmm. like, uh, like Spike Lee does that thing sometimes where people, yeah. people are just kind of gliding, yeah. um, they're moving it all. So with all the, the gestures and the, and the, the dancing and the choreography, George is just stiff. Mm. And and he doesn't seem to blink. I, I'm, I'm watching him trying to see what, how many times he blinks, and he doesn't seem to blink. He just moves his eyes. You know, maybe three or four times he, he changes his eyes. Um, and then of course suddenly his hands appear, and he gestures with his hands. And then the next time he comes out, he doesn't have the the quite all of the, the accoutrements as he has the first time. Mm -hmm. And in the end, he's kind of, he's, you know, doing a, a dance at the end. Um, but, uh, but the motionless and, and the staring that he does, I don't know if any of you saw, um, was it HBO did something about John Adams? 
couple of years yes. ago. Uh, and yeah, you see John think. Adams meeting King George. Yeah. And he has this psychotic stare. That's <laughs> mm -hmm. this silent stare that's uh, completely unnerving. Mm -hmm. um, and I almost wondered, you know, if, if the way in which that character in, in uh, Hamilton stares is maybe influenced by that or, or if they have a similar origin or something. Mm, interesting. Yeah, you know, as, as you well know, I, I think that there is there is a treasure trove of theological insight in the canon of musical theater. And with each new show, it just adds to it. But I think that there's there's a lot in Hamilton uh, that that just that preaches and and which I have quoted liberally from mm -hmm. since we saw it five years ago. Mm -hmm. You saw it before Broadway, I think, right? No, we saw it uh, right when it opened uh, in the late summer of 2015, uh, right before the tickets became impossible to buy. And we, we, we actually bought them for the typical price of a ticket at that point. But, uh, and we, you know, we, we had good seats, but one of the things I've liked about watching it on Disney is even sitting in the theater, you don't get the, the real visual close-ups, the facial close-ups, the expressions. Mm -hmm. that, that's been fun to watch. And, and that, that was the same cast that we had seen. Mm -hmm. So I think before Broadway, it was at the public theater or something, right? The public, yeah. We, we were not able to get tickets to the public. Uh, mm -hmm. Often things are sold out there uh, way before they come to my attention. And by the yeah. time all they're sold out. So. It's a small venue, so. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Lynn Manuel Miranda has acknowledged that it doesn't say a lot about slavery, but I'm surprised uh, uh, by the little clues that he slips in. There's a uh, scene in which uh, David Davis, the most magnificent Thomas Jefferson I can think of, is dancing on the stage, and he says something like, he looks aside to uh, no one in particular, and says, Sally, get me a pen, and mm -hmm. comes up uh, a whole volume of Thomas Jefferson's biography in his slave owning days and that kind of thing, uh, uh, very skillfully. And I think also the fact that uh, uh, most of the slave owners of history are portrayed by the descendants of slaves and on the stage uh, makes it uh, almost as popular a vehicle, as prophetic a vehicle as the music. There was, I remember hearing, and I don't, I don't have the Hamilton mixtape. I know all, most of our kids do, but uh, maybe that's a, a download from, from the iTunes store. But, but there was a song that wasn't in the musical, but that is on the mixtape. I had read somewhere that, that supposedly dealt more openly with the issue of slavery. Mm -hmm. Instead of the passing reference. So. Yeah, yeah, certainly that's been a criticism that I've heard that, you know, with all that's going on now, it, it almost seems dated that it's, that it's not dealing more upfront with it. Mm -hmm. I was also wondering from a, from a woman's perspective, I mean, women seem to have a, a strong role, um, some strong characters. Um, you know, they're not completely modern. Um, and there's that song Helpless. I wasn't sure what to make of the song Helpless. I mean, that's describing what it feels like to fall in love, I guess. Um. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, people have their favorite songs, and it help. Helpless is, is kind of a mess song in, in the uh, in the score. But uh, my my favorite song is the duet that is sung by Burr and by Hamilton mm -hmm. when their children are born, dear Theodosia. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's it's funny because when I look back at In the Heights, which was when we first became aware of Lin-Manuel Miranda, it's not one of the more popular songs that people remember from that show, but it, there's a, a quiet little song early on that's about, you know, breathe, respira, breathe. And I find that I'm, I'm really kind of drawn to those because there's so much emotion in them. And there's there's a lot in, in Dear Theodosia uh, especially when both Hamilton and Burr are singing to their infant children, you know, that yeah. you will grow up with our new nation, we'll make it right for you, we'll bleed mm. and fight for you. And it feels like we're still, as parents, as grandparents, trying to make it right for, mm. Mm. for those that have been entrusted to us in the subsequent mm. generations. We're, we're still mm. along that, 
that struggle of trying to make it right, which mm. kind of brings us full circle back to John Lewis and John Lewis living, leaving us a, a letter on how to continue that struggle. Yeah, yeah. That, and it's a beautiful song. I'm really, I'm really captured by that song. Mm -hmm. uh, and also by the irony of Hamilton saying he's going to be there for his son. Yeah. And they're not even there for each other. No. Okay. And, and both, both Philip Hamilton and Theodosia Bird died as, as young, very young adults. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they did not grow up with the new nation either. Yeah, yeah. And so you know someone personally from that, from that play? Uh, not from, from Hamilton, from In the Heights, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody that I've known since elementary school who, um, who was in the original cast and, and she is, you know, we talked about the grief of COVID, she lost uh, her longtime partner, spouse to, uh, to COVID uh, back mm -hmm. in March. And that's, that's how we first uh, became aware of, of Lin-Manuel Miranda and that there are there are a few people that are in the cast uh, of Hamilton that were in the original cast of Heights too. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice to see the continuity there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great it's a great ensemble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. oh, pleasure, and Martha and I have to uh, separate for these, but it's my one chance during the week to be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> be in the room where it is happening, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Your service, your service went well last week, Martha? It did. I mean, it's gone well the last two weeks. Uh, you know, we, we continue to live into it, and we've been doing communion, and somebody, uh, when we had our week,